Valdemir Zelensky is the surprising hero of Ukraine's resistance. Hi there, everyone. I'm Jeff, and you are listening to Plain English, where JR and I help you upgrade your English with current events and trending topics. This is lesson number 462 of Plain English, and you can find today's full lesson at plainenglish.com slash 462. If this is your first time listening, then you're in for a treat. People always remember the first time they listen. They remember the topic. So, if that's you, then welcome and enjoy. Most of you, though, are returning listeners, and for you, I get to keep a promise. A few weeks ago, I said I'd tell you more about Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, and so that is what I will do today. In the second half of the lesson, I'll tell you what it means to stand out. And we have a funny quote of the week about Florida. Let's get started. Volodymyr Zelensky is the president of Ukraine, for real. But before he got this job, he was the president of Ukraine on television. The show was called Servant of the People. In the show, Zelensky plays a schoolteacher who is fed up with corruption in politics. He creates a social media video in which he's complaining about corruption, and the video goes viral. And then he, the teacher, runs for the presidency and wins an improbable victory. Zelensky's character is naive but honest. He eventually succeeds as president. Then, Zelensky himself made the jump from playing a politician on TV to being one in real life. He, the real Zelensky, was also fed up with corruption in politics. And so he created a new political party in real life. That party was called, you guessed it, Servant of the People. In 2019, Zelensky was elected president of Ukraine. Zelensky's background as a performer has been a key to his success as a war leader. Both Russia and Ukraine are conducting an information war alongside the fighting war in the streets. Russia's information war is based on misinformation, falsified evidence, and an iron-fisted control of media within its borders. Ukraine's information war centers around Zelensky himself. He uses high-profile speeches and strategic media interviews to advance his cause. Let's first look at the speeches. These have not been the dull, polite policy speeches that world leaders often give when speaking to an international crowd. Instead, they have been deeply personal appeals for help. And Zelensky is not shy about telling the world's parliaments and presidents that they're not doing enough 
to help. In a video address to the Canadian Parliament, Zelensky asked how Canadians would feel if Russia bombed Vancouver or destroyed the CN Tower in Toronto. He described Ukrainian memorials that have been destroyed, and he said, Every night is a horrible night. Days later, in a video address to the U.S. Congress, Zelensky showed a graphic video of war victims. He said that Ukraine has been suffering attacks like September 11th every night. At that point, the war was already three weeks long. Though he primarily spoke through a translator, he closed his speech with a direct appeal to Joe Biden in English. He said Biden was the leader of a great nation, but that he needed to be the leader of the world. Zelensky has also addressed legislatures in Greece, Finland, Australia, the UK, Japan, France, Germany, Italy, Israel, and others. And he wasn't repeating the same speech each time. In the UK, he quoted Winston Churchill. In France, he cited the country's founding principles of liberté, égalité, fraternité. In Japan, he talked about nuclear disaster. In Germany, the fall of the Berlin Wall. In America, 9-11 and Pearl Harbor. He pointed out that Russian leaders vacation in Italy, and then he told the Italian Chamber of Deputies not to be the resort for murderers. Zelensky also addressed the United Nations and directly accused Russia of war crimes. In these speeches, and in many more private conversations, Zelensky has been asking directly for two things, weapons and a no-fly zone over Ukraine. A no-fly zone would mean another country would shoot down any plane in the sky over Ukraine. No country is willing to do that and risk direct fighting conflict with Russia, so the answer has always been no, no matter how passionate the appeal. In the case of weapons, the West has provided mostly defensive arms. Zelensky is grateful, but he's not shy about telling presidents and prime ministers that they're not doing enough. Another part of Zelensky's strategy has been a whirlwind media tour from Kyiv, the besieged capital. He hosted two editors from The Economist for a one-on-one -on -one interview. This was intended to reach the policymakers and leaders who read that newspaper. Then, he gave an interview to 60 Minutes, a long-running American weekly news television program. In it, he said, We are defending the right to live. I never thought that right was so costly. That interview was intended to influence American public opinion. Most surprising, though, was his outreach to Russia. On March 28th, he gave an interview to four independent Russian journalists. In the interview, 
he sharply criticized the Russian government, but he also opened the door to a potential compromise to end the war. He said Ukraine would be willing to remain neutral between the West and Russia and would not pursue nuclear weapons. Predictably, media regulators in Moscow didn't appreciate the interview. They banned the broadcast of the interview in Russia and promised to investigate the media outlets that distributed it. But the interview is available on Telegram, and the most popular apps in Russia are now Telegram and VPN apps that help people get around Russian media censorship. One other thing stands out about Zelensky's media appearances, and that is his dress. The Ukrainian president doesn't wear the typical uniform of world leaders. You know, the formal business suit, crisp white shirt, and neutral tie. Instead, he appears in a tight-fitting olive green t-shirt, sometimes with an olive green jacket or sweatshirt over it. The t-shirts give him an everyman appearance. Here's someone who's hard at work defending his country in a war. He doesn't have time to play dress-up for the cameras. In a light-hearted moment, one interviewer asked him about his shirts. She asked if he had had them before the war. Zelensky responded that he did have these shirts in this style before, just not quite as many as he has now. The t-shirts are a hit online. On Amazon, Etsy, and other online platforms, you can buy olive green t-shirts. The ads for the shirts say, Ukrainian President Zelensky T and Ukrainian Symbol t-shirt. One cheeky ad says, as seen on TV. Many of the sellers pledge to send part of their earnings to Ukraine. Netflix had the show Servant of the People in its streaming library until 2021, but they recently brought it back, at least in the U.S. So you can watch the real-life president, real-life war leader, play a president on TV back before he became a politician. Today's English expression is stand out. To stand out is to be noticeable, especially in comparison to other similar things or other things nearby. Today's current events lesson was about Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine. He has appeared before legislatures around the world, building support for the Ukrainian cause. He's asking for weapons, financial support, sanctions, and a no-fly zone over his country. His words have been very powerful. But one other thing stands out about his speeches, and that is his dress. His dress stands out because his dress is noticeable in comparison to other presidents and world leaders. 
he wears a close-fitting olive green t-shirt. When he's not wearing that, it's an olive green sweatshirt or button-down shirt. This stands out because most presidents and prime ministers wear business suits when they make official appearances. There's nothing strange about Zelensky's t-shirts. It's only noticeable when you compare him to other similar people, other world leaders. His dress stands out. It's noticeable in comparison to similar things. What stands out to you about where you live? I'll answer about Chicago. The architecture here stands out, especially in downtown. The architecture is beautiful in comparison to other large cities. One thing that stands out to me about New York is the energy on the streets. That's what I notice. That's what I think is different than in similar cities. Those of you who have been to New York probably remember that first moment when you stepped out of a taxi or when you got to the top of the stairs in Penn Station. You just feel the rush of energy on the streets, the traffic, the pedestrians, the sound, the sights. The energy on the streets is unique and noticeable in comparison to other cities. That's why I say the energy in New York stands out. I went to Vienna on vacation last fall. And here's what stood out to me about Vienna. The buildings were handsome and old and distinguished, but also so modern at the same time. The buildings might be old and majestic, but you walk into the ground floor and the light is bright, the furniture is sleek, the espresso machines are gleaming and new, the street-level windows are floor-to-ceiling glass. So why did this stand out? I think it's because when I think of Europe, Madrid, Paris, London, I definitely think of nice old buildings. But those old buildings have a certain, let's just say, charm. They're beautiful, charming, full of history, but maybe not fully modern. So when I think about Vienna, the buildings stand out because A, they're old, but B, they're also so modern. Now, we don't all have to agree when we use stand out. You may have gone to Vienna and not even noticed how modern the stores and buildings looked. You may have even thought the opposite. It doesn't matter. It's about what we sense and perceive. I thought the architecture stood out, but something else may have stood out to you. So far, we've used stand out for things that you can look at, but it doesn't always have to be something visual. Here's another thing that stood out to me in Europe. A lot of cafes don't open until about nine in the morning. Vienna is famous for its coffee and cafe culture. So I set out one morning to get my first cup of the day 
and I found several cafes were closed at eight o'clock in the morning on a weekday. Now that stood out to me. That was noticeable or surprising to me. Why? Because let me tell you something about the United States. We buy our coffee early. Most coffee shops, at least in the cities, open no later than seven in the morning on a weekday. Even seven o'clock is late. If you have a coffee shop and you open at nine in the morning, you've missed the majority of your potential customers. A lot of us buy our coffee on the way to work. It wakes us up in the morning. When I go into the office, I get coffee on the way in. Now I never get there that early, but the coffee shop I go to opens at five o'clock in the morning, and that's typical for a city center here. So you can imagine my surprise when I strolled out of my apartment at what I thought was a leisurely hour of eight o'clock. Only to find the cafes weren't even open yet, and that stood out to me. That was noticeable in comparison to other similar things, or in comparison to what I expected. Going to a cafe in Europe is less of an early morning thing and more of a midday activity. After you've gotten your day started, for five straight years, Florida has been the U.S. state with the most net migration. You calculate net migration by adding the people who move in. And subtracting the people who move out. Well, if you do that for all fifty U.S. states, you'll find that Florida has the greatest net migration. People want to move there, in other words, and it's not just since the pandemic. It's been the top state for net migration. For five years, so I loved this quote from a Virginia congressman in the year 1845. He said, "No man would immigrate into Florida, not from hell itself." Now that was back before Florida was a state. Congressman John Randolph was arguing that the U.S. should not acquire Florida from Spain at that point. No man would immigrate into Florida, not from hell itself, was the opinion of John Randolph in 1845. How things have changed. Now, in fairness. He was speaking before the invention of air conditioning. Well, let me tell you something that stands out to me about all of you. Well, listen, I don't know all of you, but I have gotten to know a lot of you through social media, email, and through our calls and forums in the Plain English Plus membership. And one thing that really stands out to me is how much you like using English to engage with the world. And you know, so many English programs are about here are the things you find in your kitchen, or 
here's how to leave a voicemail. And there is a place for that. You do have to learn that stuff. But you here at Plain English, you want to use English to learn about the world, to think about the hard topics, laugh once in a while, even disagree sometimes. Don't deny it. I know you disagree sometimes, and that's okay. But what really stands out to me is how much you want to get out of the traditional classroom, traditional course style and really use English to learn about the world. And I love learning about it alongside all of you. You really are an inspiration to me. And that is what stands out about this audience. So remember, we'll be back again on Thursday with another lesson. It's going to be another TV series review on Thursday. We'll be talking about the HBO series Succession. It's going to be good. See you then.